Good morning. On behalf of Provost John Cotesworth, I would like to thank you for being with us today for the inaugural Science of Learning Symposium and the official launch event of the Columbia Science of Learning Research Initiative. Uh, I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Mike Purdy, the Columbia's Executive Vice President for Research, to deliver opening remarks. Good morning, everyone, and, uh, and welcome. It, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here at the inaugural symposium marking the uh, official launch of Columbia's Science of Learning Research Initiative that will showcase research on metacognition by experts in the science of learning. Our most important responsibility as academics is to effectively and efficiently transfer knowledge and understanding to colleagues and students, finding new mechanisms that permit more effective transfer of that knowledge and understanding from one human to another is a mission that is at the very core of our profession. The Science of Learning Research Initiative aspires to be a catalyst that will stimulate cross-disciplinary research at Columbia that we hope will substantially advance the scholarship of teaching and learning. The initiative will draw together faculty and researchers from many Columbia schools, departments, and institutes, including psychology, sociology, statistics, the natural sciences, of course, economics, computer science, business school, medical school, data science institute, the Zuckerman Mind, Brain, and Behavior Institute, and Teachers College. The results of these research efforts will provide the foundation for new approaches to pedagogy and experimentation in our on-campus and online educational offerings. The impact of these efforts will be felt across the whole of the university. The transfer of knowledge is our core mission, I say again. It's tough to think of a higher priority for us as academics than figuring out how to fulfill this mission more effectively. So this promises to be an important and stimulating day of talks and discussion. And with that, let me hand off to the Executive Director of Columbia's uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, Catherine Ross. Good morning, everyone. As the Executive Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Columbia University, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this first-of-a-kind event. Today, we join together faculty, staff, graduate, and undergraduate students from across campus and beyond to create a new community dedicated to the science of learning. The Center for Teaching and Learning is thrilled to partner with Solaire. In the CTL, we are committed to synthesizing and translating the research on the science of learning into teaching methods and strategies that are practical, equitable, and easily implemented in any learning context. Our mission is to share these evidence-based practices with the Columbia teaching community. I want to thank the Office of the Provost for supporting both the Center for Teaching and Learning and the Science of Learning Initiative, and for bringing us together for today's event. Many thanks also to Dr. Janet Metcalf for her enthusiastic support and, in fact, for convincing her research colleagues to join us here today. <laughs> A huge thank you also to the CTL team who have worked on every aspect of planning this event and supporting it throughout the day today. I want to give special recognition to Dr. Susanna Claff, who has worked tirelessly with me since last spring to get this event organized. Now I am delighted to turn this stage over to our amazing research presenters. 
I will introduce them all in order to save time during the event for the research talks. I will give very brief bio statements, but please note that we have full biographies on our website. If you pick up one of these cards at the registration desk, you can go to that bit.ly and find out the um, full extent of the contributions that this group has made to the science of learning. So our first presenter this morning will be Dr. Janet Metcalf. You want to wave, Janet? <laughs> Um, professor of Psychology and Neurobiology and Behavior here at Columbia University. Our second presenter will be Dr. Robert Bjork, Distinguished Research Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Our final presenter for the morning, per uh, morning per portion is Dr. Sian Bylock, the eighth president of Barnard and author of the critically acclaimed book, Choke. We also have two moderators for this morning's session, Dr. Elizabeth Bjork, professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and Dr. Dylan William, Emeritus Professor of Educational Assessment at University College in London. The format will consist of three 35-minute research presentations with five minutes for questions after each one. You will notice that we have microphones placed in the aisle, so if you would like to ask a question, please walk up to the microphone. Uh, at the end of the presentations, there will be a few minutes left for a moderated discussion and further questions from the audience. Thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Um, thanks very much, um, and particularly thanks to, for being coerced into coming. It's really wonderful. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Suleiman Kachani, who has really been the fuel for getting the CTL and solar up and going. And given that this is the core mission of the university, it's just a wonderful contribution that you've made to all of us. Um, Catherine Ross, of course, is the director of CTL, and her efforts have been incredible. Um, David Madigan was the vice president who actually got this all going and off the ground. And we spent many years um, to make CTL a reality, which it really is now. Um, Catherine has had over a thousand interactions with faculty and more than a thousand interactions to help their teaching with graduate students. And John Coatsworth, the, pre the provost, um, has sponsored everything and encouraged everything that's happening with this program. Um, I'd also, as far as the research that I'm going to talk about today, I'd like to thank some of my students, uh, Paul Bloom, Matt Ivoire, Judy Zhu, Emily Towner, da David Friedman is a colleague, and Bennett Schwartz is a colleague. So you're going to see a lot of their work. This is echoing. Okay. There are two traditional perspectives that people take on education. Perspective one is that the mind is a bucket, maybe a pail, and we as faculty need to fill that bucket with knowledge. The second perspective is that what we're supposed to do is incite curiosity and exploration and get people to do it themselves. There's no question of where we all stand. Um, education is not the filling up of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And you can find this everywhere. 
You can go online and people who are building uh, startups will say, education is not the filling of a bucket, but the lighting of a fire. And it's attributed to William Butler Yeats. It, you find this, uh, you can buy videos of education, of fill, not filling the bucket, lighting the fire. You can get a mug. <laughs> you can get t-shirts. You can get t-shirts if you're pregnant. And you can get, once the babies are born, you can get t-shirts that have the logo. Education is not the filling of a bucket or pail, but the lighting of a fire. A little bit of trivia. There's no evidence that Yeats actually wrote this. Um, uh, Robert Strong did a study of all of Yeats's work and found no mention, this quote isn't there. Um, and furthermore, Yeats scholars, that doesn't even sound like Yeats. I'm not a Yeats scholar, so I really can't comment on that. It looks like it might be attributable to Plutarch, depending on the uh, translation. But regardless of who said it, everyone agrees. The substance of the idea is uncontroversial. And yet, when we and other people in psychology have done studies that would look at whether students are engaged in this way, they've looked at the opposite of curiosity in the form of a mind wandering. What we find is that lighting that fire is a really difficult task. So depending upon the study that you look at, if you look at a one-hour lecture, and the first half hour of that lecture, you probe people. Of course, people can't tell you if they're mind-wandering because they're too busy mind-wandering. But if you probe them, what you can ask them is, are you mind-wandering right now? And when you do that, 25% of the time, during a lecture, people are mind-wandering. And when you get to the second half of the lecture, it's even worse. It goes up to 44%. Um, with video recorded lectures, it's even worse. 35% in the first half, 52%. So half the time, now I know nobody in the audience is mind wandering yet. Okay. Um, so it seems to me that we need to be looking more at the curiosity, at what we can do, what curiosity is to begin with. We all agree that we should be doing this and trying to get our students to be curious, but what we don't really know is how to do it. So the first step is to look at curiosity itself, and then we'll try to see if there's anything that can be done. Um, mind wandering, by the way, has a neural signature, and you can look at people's event-related potentials. So if you put the electrodes on the head and you time lock to the onset of a stimulus that you want the student to learn. And in the case, I'm going to show you a picture of a um, study that was done by uh, Zhu. And she was having students learn Spanish-English translations. So they needed to learn these materials. And they were pre being presented again and again. And from time to time, she would probe them and say, are you mind wandering? And when they said no, she would take the nine items before the, the I'm on task signal from the student. And when they said, yes, I'm mind wandering, she'd take those nine items. So she was able to see what was going on when people were trying to learn while they were mind wandering. What, so what was happening in their brain? And what she found was that you have the, the I have no pointer, so you'll have to do it. You'll have to look. Um, on the ordinate, we have the voltage of a uh, differential of the brain. And on the abscissa, we have time. And what you see is a, are two waves. The bottom wave is mind wandering, and the top wave is being on task. And for about the first 300 milliseconds, the first third of a second, 
People are processing the sensory information in about the same way, whether they're mind wandering or they're not mind wandering. After a third of a second, you see the curves go apart. And what you see is that l much less is happening when you're mind wandering than when you're on task. And this translates into what you're doing to get this information into memory. So on the left, we have what's happening with on task and mind wandering. And we can back conditionalize so that we separate those items that people remembered and those items that people forgot and look at the signatures of remembered items and forgotten items. And they're almost identical to mind wandering or not mind wandering. So you're not getting the information into memory when you're mind wandering that 50% of the time when you're mind wandering. Okay. So, if you, so I'm going to argue that the signature for mind wandering, may, for being on task, may be similar to the signature for curiosity. And the signal for mind wandering, the low curve here, may be what happens when you're not curious. Okay, so we come to the question, what exactly is curiosity? And we have some information on that. Um, the first person who discussed curiosity as a psychologist in any depth was Daniel Berline. Um, Daniel Berline was a distinguished scholar um, and he argued that curiosity occurs when we almost know. So when we don't have, we're not, we, we have to have some knowledge, but not full knowledge. If we already know, we're bored. We don't have to do anything. We're not curious about those things. But if we don't have enough information to make any sense of what's going on, we can't be curious either. So it's somewhere in the middle. And he also argued that curiosity is a basic reinforcer. He was a behaviorist, and he thought that curiosity was like food and like sex. I'm going to suggest a slight change. Um, I'm going to say that, and I think it's one that Berlin would take issue with. I'm going to suggest that it's not that curiosity is when we almost know, but it's when we think we almost know. That is, that it's metacognitive. It has to be metacognitive for this symposium, right? Okay, so there you go. Um, I don't think Berlin would agree with this. Um, I was in one of his last classes, which is a history of psychology class, and he was a wonderful scholar. And he started talking about the early Greeks and um, the psyche, and he would discuss um, mental life and introspection and all these things very fairly. So I was really excited about metacognition and consciousness. I went to his office, and he totally cut me off at the knees. He was a behaviorist. He understood these things, but he didn't believe that they were of any import. So he would say that it's just the information that we know, not what we believe about the information. OK, so here's where we're going. I'm going to suggest that curiosity is a metacognitive state. It occurs when we think we almost know. Um, second, the state of curiosity enhances recall and encoding. It has a distinctive neural signature, and it's rewarding. That is, it is a reinforcer. And because it's a metacognitive state, and we know from a lot of research that's been done by some people in this room, that we can manipulate people's metacognition we might be able to use this metacognitive malleability to increase curiosity. OK, so um, if we look at people's metacognition, they're feeling that they know, 
we can look at this on a continuum from they don't know much on the left, very low feeling of knowing, to moderate to high, to the feeling that they've mastered the material. And curiosity has this odd function where the things that you're most curious about are the close, the highest feeling of knowing before you feel that you've mastered it. And then you're not interested anymore. Once you've got it, you've got it. So what we're looking for as materials to be, to, that will make people curious, are to have them in this region of proximal learning, which just a little bit below mastered, but you know a lot about it. So suppose I ask you, uh, in what state is the Statue of Liberty? You say? OK, you say something. So here's what I think you're doing. When at the top in green, when a question is presented, you try to integrate all the information that you know, retrieve it from memory. And once you've retrieved whatever you know, you have to make a decision. It's a metacognitive decision. Do you know the answer? If you do, you go to the right for you, and you give the answer. You, you get a reward for giving the answer. You feel good about that. And you learn that, and then you continue and go to the next question. No curiosity in any of that. When you say no, you don't know the answer, you have a second metacognitive decision to make. Okay, Do you know enough to continue working on it, trying? So is the amount of information that you've got above the threshold, a lower threshold that you have that thinks you might be able to get it? If you say no to that, you, you go out of the loop and you might start mind wandering or you might just go to the next question. If you say yes to that, you're in a state of curiosity. Okay? And you, there's a parameter in this Model C and you increase that, which is going to increase your, um, it's going to increase your learning and it's going to increase your motivation when you increase C. Okay. So then you go up and you start searching some more, and you search everywhere you can, and you're very open to feedback. And once you, then you go through the loop again, and this time you might get it, because you've been exploring. So that's, so what we want to do to get people curious is get them to the second box and get them to feel that they have enough information that they want to seek out information. So that's the trick. So um, here's the map, and you can see that the Statue of Liberty is on the New Jersey side. So Dylan said New Jersey. You sure? You want a close-up of the map? Here's a close-up of the map. Now take a look, a very careful look at the border. It's New York. I'm sorry. It's New York. Mm -hmm. uh, so there she is. And there was a compact in 1834. New York owned all the water right up to the Jersey Shore until then. And they made a deal to have the border in the middle of the river. And except that New York got all the islands, right? So the Statue of Liberty is actually um, what they call an exclave of New York, and New York owns it. Although New Jersey does most of the services for it, thank you very much. The story with Ellis Island is even worse than this. New Jersey owns 90% because it's made of landfill, and the landfill didn't apply to the islands, so. Okay, so we're going to look into two cognitive paradigms that are related to curiosity because, like this question, they fall into the region of proximal learning. The first is the classic, the tip of the tongue state. And the second is high confidence errors. That's our time. 
Um, the tip of the tongue state is the state that everybody knows about. Um, my colleague Bennett Schwartz asked 87 different language groups what, if they knew what the, the word was for the tip of the tongue state, and they all said yes. So it looks like all human beings know about it, including people who do um, sign language. And for people with sign language, it's a sparking at the end of your fingers. Okay, no tongue, but it's the same. Um, it's fairly rare, it occurs about once a week um, more for people who are older, but you can get people into a tip of the tongue state if you don't give them too long to think about it. Okay, so it seems to have to do, so we were able to get people into many tip of the tongue states by giving them particular questions and only allowing them five seconds to think about it and then asking them. So, um, the state, the tip of the tongue state is associated with emotions. Um, Brown and McNeil say you're seized by a tip of the tongue state, would appear to be in mild torment, something like the brink of a sneeze. Um, personal introspections of inner turmoil when grappling for an elusive uh, word. And uh, Weiner says that such emotions are goads to action. So we're thinking about it as a goad to cognitive action, to finding out, to curiosity. So these are the kinds of questions. Who was the first ruler of the Holy Roman Empire? Maybe some of you will get into a tip of the tongue for some of these. What's the name of the river that runs through Rome? What's the name of the mountain range that separates Asia from Europe? What's the last name of the discoverer of the vaccination for smallpox? What's the last name of the first person to set foot on the moon? Columbia students get into tip of the tongue states about a third to half the time with these questions. And you can look at, um, you can ask them, are you in a tip of the tongue state? And they'll say yes or no. And then you can see whether they're curious. You can say, do you want to see the answer? And so we did that. And what we found in the dark bars is that when people were in a tip of the tongue state, they were about twice as likely to want to see the answer than when they weren't. Um, this is for missionaries where they don't say anything. This is for commissionaries where they've come up with something but they're still in a tip of the tongue state, maybe a blocker. And sometimes they even get into a tip of the tongue state when they're right, okay? They say something, it's right, but they seem to not know it and they want to know the answer. And it's two to one, it's big. When you give them the answer and then you test them later, what you find is that the probability of getting the answer correct, this, these are always on answers that they didn't get right, okay, so always conditionalized on being wrong. It's about 0.75 if they were in a tip of the tongue state and about 0.52 if they weren't. It's an enormous difference. And during the feedback to questions that were given feedback following a tip of the tongue state, the ERP signature is really distinctive. Um, on the bottom we've got in red, no tip of the tongue. And on the top we've got tip of the tongue. And what you see is that after about a third of a second, people are processing when they're in a tip of the tongue state and less so, okay? Less so when they're not. And this mirrors the pattern when you divide the data into those that they remember and the, those that they don't. It mirrors the pattern that you get at time of encoding for those items, okay? So, um, the tip of the tongue state is a spontaneous metacognitive state, and it's associated with a particular feeling. Um, there are other metacognitive states, and the one that we've looked at quite a bit is um, the feeling that you get when you learn that you've made a high confidence error. Okay. So what are these? What kind of music is associated with the Cajuns in Louisiana? And you say jazz, and you say jazz with high confidence. 
And then you're given the answer, Zydeco. So you thought you were right, but you weren't. When you're tested a week, retested a week later, you remember Zydeco. So it looks like high confidence errors are also in this region of proximal learning. You start with the green rectangle at the top and you encode the question, you accumulate information, you think you've got enough information and that you've got it right and you give the answer in the right. But you haven't, you find out that you were wrong. So whoops, you have to go down, but you've got a lot of information, enough that you actually generated a response. And so you seek, and you're open, and your curiosity is inspired by high confidence errors. Um, Emily Towner recently did a study where she looked at people's curiosity after they had given a high confidence error. And she didn't give the correction, she just said you're wrong. And what happens is that there's a correspondence, a correlation between confidence in the air and curiosity. And we know that high confidence errors are corrected more than low confidence errors and more than omits. So at a delay in, delay in test, the high confidence error questions that are now the corrections, you'll get, get, it, get it right 82% of the time. If it was a low confidence error that you made, it's only 73%. If it's an omit, it's only, what, 48%. So there's a big difference. Um, and we get a distinctive ERP signature. So compare, and it's not quite the same, but it's pretty close. So after about 300 milliseconds, a third of a second, there's a difference between the high confidence errors, what you're doing when you're processing the feedback, to the high confidence as compared to the low confidence errors. Is curiosity related to reward? Well, maybe. There have been several fMRI studies that have looked at people in the scanner when they're in the state of curiosity. So you ask, you give them questions, you ask them whether they're curious. And the two studies that I've looked at both implicate the reward do dopamine system as being selectively activated during that time period. So it looks like there's, that Berlin maybe was right, that there is a reinforcing value. Um, so the nucleus of commons is a well-known area that's related to the dopamine system and to the reward system. And the, these results are really quite clear. Uh, whether it's quite the reward that we think about as being fun rewarding, because these studies were done before people had come up with the answer. So they were really in this nagging state I think this bears more exploration because we don't really know what that state is. But it's a state that's motivating. But it might not be so much fun. It might really be nagging. Finally, does it matter whether curiosity is a metacognitive or cognitive? Well, this is my, this is my difference with Berlin. And I think that it matters. I think that it matters because we can manipulate metacognition. There have been many studies, it's almost a cottage industry, with people in the field of metacognition doing something to alter people's metacognition. So you prime words in the queue or in the question, and what you find is that people think they're gonna get the answer they're more likely to get the answer from that, but they're not more likely to get the answer. Or you make the text easier to read, and people think they'll, they know it better. But it doesn't have any impact on later memory, if you don't do anything in between. 
So we have, there's almost a cottage industry on illusions of metacognition. And mostly those illusions have been taken as something that is, um, undermines the study of metacognition, if you like, because our metacognition isn't always accurate, right? But it may be that we could use this inaccuracy to our advantage. So we know how to manipulate metacognition. And we may be able to do that in such a way that we could get people into a state of curiosity. That depends upon our metacognition being causal for what we're going to do. So there have been many studies that show that people are usually often overconfident. So they think they know an answer when in fact they don't know the answer. So they think they're up here in the mastered. And if you're in the mastered, you're not going to do anything. You're going to just let it go. But in fact, if we were to look at what they really know, so now we're talking knowing on the abscissa, not feeling of knowing on the abscissa, they're, they're, they really would be in the region of proximal learning. They just don't know it. So can we get them to know that, they're, that they should be seeking more, that they should be curious? Um, my favorite metacognitive illusion is one that our next speaker uh, devised, devised, explored. Um, he found, along with Coriette, Sheffer, and Barr, that the framing of the question matters. So people were in a memory experiment, and if you ask them how likely it is that you're going to remember the answer, they say, very likely. If you say, how likely is that you're going to forget the answer? Hmm, well, I might forget it. And of course, the relation between those two is that one minus the probability of remembering should equal the probability of forgetting, but it doesn't, okay? If you do the equation, people think that they don't know if you ask the don't know question, but they think that they know if you ask the no question. So it's a nifty manipulation, <laughs> um, but does it have any impact? And I think one of the hints that we have, and it's only a hint because this wasn't a curiosity study per se, but there was a study done to see whether people actually act on that. And it was done by Bridget Finn in 2008. And what she did was ask people whether they would remember or whether they would forget. And then she asked them whether they wanted to study. And what she found was that in every case, if they were asked the forget the question, they were less confident and they wanted to study. OK, the summary. Curiosity occurs when we think we almost know. That is not, that is not yet well established. Okay, so I say that this is still a hypothesis. It may be that it occurs when we think we almost know. Um, it, every study that's been done so far looking at curiosity has been correlational. So it could be that Berlin is right, and it's the amount of actual knowledge that we have that drives whether we'll seek or not. But it could be that the fans of metacognition are right, and that it's what we think we know that's crucial. So if it's the latter, then we, have, we may have a wedge into improving the learning. Um, second, the state of curiosity enhances recall. Everyone finds that. It has a distinctive signature. And both of those things are still undecided because we don't know whether it, it's because you have more information that it has a distinctive signature or it's because the state itself is putting you into this mode. And it looks like it's rewarding. So we may be able to use the malleability of metacognition to increase curiosity with positive consequences for learning. Thank you. It's my dead cat.
Okay, we have, so, how much time do we have for question? Five minutes? Okay, um, speakers, want, do you want to ask a question? The mics don't seem to be working. Okay. Are the are the floor mics yeah, working? The mics are okay, so so we can take questions. The floor mics are working. This is working. Hi, thank you very much. Um, and I would love to hear more about the dead cat at some point. But um, do you have a sense of how much uh, an exercise like the Statue of Liberty at the beginning of class might increase curiosity in general that might stretch through a classroom? And uh, maybe a second part of that is uh, outside of like kind of an experimental setting where they're in a class because ostensibly they want to learn something. How much does the, um, you talked about the, um, overconfidence in what they know, but how much does needing or wanting to know uh, matter for that? Yeah, I'm sure they're disposed, we don't have enough information about this yet. I mean, so I have only sort of anecdotal evidence about things like that. I do know that um, Richard Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize last year, um, told me that he, before each of his classes, he gives his students like insight problems to solve. And he believes that that gets them very fired up and curious. The, the graph that I showed you about, you know, the flow chart, if you're in a state of curiosity much of the time, then presumably that's going to have dispositional consequences. That you realize that you don't know everything, but that you can learn and you can find out. And once you know that you're learning and finding out, you're kind of in a growth mindset where you'll be more curious. So we think that, it's, that, that the process is cyclical and that you can build it up. Um, but that you can also, if you're in the mind-wandering state all the time, rather than in the state where you're seeking information and getting rewarded for it, you're not going to be building up that, that need. So, but the empirical, there are no empirical data. I think the field is pretty wide open, actually. Um, hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is um, Elaine Perlman, and I'm the director of the Peace Corps Fellows Program at Teachers College. But the most fun part of my week is I teach a seventh and eighth grade class at the Harlem Education Activities Fund. And this year I'm teaching a class called, um, they let me teach whatever I want, so I'm teaching a class called Cultivating Our Curiosity. And it's based on the book, um, after reading Brian Grazer's book, um, A Curious Mind, The Secret to a Better Life. And uh, currently in New York City public schools, uh, students are taking 13 tests, standardized tests on average per year. And in a lot of schools, teachers can't even give regular kinds of quizzes and tests because they're so, the students are so overwhelmed. And what I think about standardized tests is that they are designed to squash, quash, destroy, um, curiosity, because it's all about um, it's all about what your the score and trying to imagine what the test writer had in mind. Um, so, in in a way, I think it's a deliberate um, attempt to um, kill students' curiosity. And I'm wondering how um, y this can be uh, this sort of formulaic um, test-oriented um, elementary, middle, and high school experience of students. Um, if you've seen it at all impacting college or undergraduate or graduate level students. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, the standardized tests are really controversial. I'm a very big fan of testing to learn, though. I'm not so much a fan of testing to evaluate people and put them in their silos or their categories. But there's, there, are a lot of there are a lot of important studies that have shown that when people test themselves, or when they're tested but without these kinds of emotional consequences, they're asked the questions and they have to generate the answer and they find, oh, maybe I don't know, maybe I better go look that up and find out about that. 
Um, and the teachers can use that to understand, uh, Dylan will talk about this more, I'm sure, later, but to understand what areas the students don't know and where they can where they can guide them and how they can get them into this region of proximal learning and even over the over the 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 threshold i th so i think that tests may be misused to categorize people so so strictly and that we maybe underplay the value that you know, people like doing crossword puzzles. They like doing, you know, trivia tests and so on. The thing about the tests is that they have this very heavy um, feel because they're comparative with other students and they're gateways to educational opportunities. So I'm not against tests. In fact, I'm really in favor of them. But, not, but they need to be used differently than they are. So formative assessments, great. You know, evaluative assessment, not so good. Okay. I'm sort of uh, been asked to be the police here, so uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I'm a student at Columbia Business School, and my question is regarding the chart you showed on feeling of knowing versus curiosity. Could you chat about uh, what the literature shows in regards to the curiosity level for masters? Because the chart did not, the, the, the function did not continue into that region for mastery. Uh, yeah, uh, what you find when people make judgments of learning is that if they know that they've actually got the answer right, they will, they won't bother studying those things. And it's rational. If you, you're wasting your time, if you absolutely know the answer to some simple question, you're wasting your time studying that or exploring it more. So the, the, um, the mastered category is that when, really is important when people think that they have the answer but they haven't. So most of the time they're right. When they think that they have the answer, they have the answer and it's not worth their time and it's rational for them to not study and to not be curious about it. It only, it, it only makes, makes for a problem when they're overconfident, okay? And that's the only time that you would want to change that. Presumably, if they really know, and you give them this, neg this framing, will you forget, or uh, have you got this wrong, they'll check it again, and they'll say, no, I've got it right. And they'll be right. 